Transcribed. The National Broadcasting Company presents Biography in Sound. Tonight, George Washington, the man nobody knows. He has been buried for 200 years under tons of plaster, stone, ink, patriotic bombast. We remember him by his little hatchet and the face on a dollar bill. When we think of him, it is as a grim, inhuman hero staring down at us from the walls of classrooms and museums, the Copleys and the Stuarts. Washington, the man, is lost. And yet there is no need for him to be lost. We have countless documents, letters, accounts. We have the research of historians, the guesses of psychologists. What was he like? What was he like when he took off his wig and unbuttoned his waistcoat? What of the human being whose greatness is only magnified by his struggle with himself, with his human longings and fears. He never cared about me. He treated me like I was an old almanac, out of date. His mother, Mary Ball Washington. I have never honored or respected him. He mistreated his men and campaigned unwisely. General Charles Lee. Malice could never blast his honor. John Adams. His features were indicative of the strongest and most ungovernable passions. Had he been born in the forests, he would have been the fiercest among the savages. No casual judgment, but the words of Gilbert Stuart, who spent many days painting the man from life. With respect to myself, I think the arrangement is not quite as it ought to have been, that I, who would much rather be at home, should occupy a place with which great many younger and gayer women would be prodigiously pleased. I'm still determined to be cheerful and to be happy. His wife, Martha Custis Washington. The world has no business to know the object of my love declared in this manner to you when I want to conceal it. George Washington to Sally Fairfax, four months after his public engagement to Martha Custis. Where did his greatness lie? Well, certainly he was by any standards a great man. Historians are inclined very often to conceive of him as some sort of savior, born perfect and filled with virtue. The truth is that he developed as a man and as a personality over a period of many years, and this is the key to understanding him. Moncure Conway wrote in 1892, The Washington family has passed into a conventionalization curiously resembling that of the Holy Family. The savior of his country has, for his mother, a saintly Mary. His father is kept in the background like Joseph. He is born in a mean abode. The first I ever knew Augustine had a son by his second wife was when he wrote that he was coming to Westmoreland to visit me. He just said bringing my baby son, George, with me. I learned that George had been born at Wakefield, Virginia, on February 22nd, 1732, a new style calendar. His father, Augustine, was a friend of mine, had iron mines and few plantations. Augustine died when George was 11, a throat infection. Just like his son, come to think of it. Well, anyway, I never did get to know his wife very well. I lost track of George after his father died. I think his mother sent him away right after that uh, to live with his half-brother, Lawrence. I guess they didn't get on too well, uh, him and his mother. The whole record of Mary Ball Washington's life shows that she was a selfish woman, preoccupied with her own needs. She was generous enough, but she wasn't content with giving she wished passionately to possess in return, according to historian Francis Bellamy. Unlike the other children, Mr. Bellamy writes, George could not respond to this devouring need for devotion on his mother's part. The resulting conflict was so bitter that he was engaged in it for almost the rest of his life. As a matter of fact, he was the only one of Mary Ball's sons to surmount her powerful maternity. Charles died in drink. Samuel of women... And Jack remained tied to her all his life. No, sir. In all the years I was with him as his man, she never come once to see him. For 30 years after he married Miss Custis, 
His mother never showed a face at Mount Vernon. In the 83rd year of her life, Mary Ball Washington lay on her deathbed in Fredericksburg, Virginia. I only want to hear from him with his own hand that he is well. She did not hear. Alone, without a word from his mother, he had been sworn in as first president of the United States in New York City. On August 25th, 1789, Mary Ball Washington died of cancer. In the words of Mr. Bellamy, she was a tragic figure in any age, but one who had made her son a rebel in his own self-defense, a fact whose vast importance to the world still cannot be overestimated. At the age of 11, following his father's death, his mother sent him to stay with his half-brother, Lawrence Washington, at Mount Vernon. It has ever been my opinion... Lawrence Washington writing to Governor Dinwiddie in London when the question came up of allowing non-members of the Church of England to settle in the lands beyond the Blue Ridge. It has ever been my opinion that restrictions on the conscience are cruel in regard to those on whom they are imposed. This from the man who was to exert a tremendous influence on George Washington during the formative years between 11 and 16. England, Holland, and Prussia are examples I may quote, and much more, Pennsylvania, which has flourished under that delightful liberty so as to become the admiration of every man who considers the short time it has been settled. Six years of exposure to a doctrine which was shockingly liberal for those times. Except for a few Quakers, we in Virginia have no dissenters. But what has been the consequence? We have increased by slow degrees, while our neighboring communities, whose natural advantages are inferior to ours, have become increasingly populous. His companion during these years was young George William Fairfax son of the colonel who lived as neighbor to Lawrence Washington. This is young Fairfax speaking. We used to go surveying together. One summer, father sent us across the Shenandoah Valley. George was the finest horseman I have ever seen. He could stay in the saddle for hours without tiring. Even at that age, he was a giant. Six feet two and two hundred pounds without an ounce of fat on him. He used to be quiet for long periods of time when we were together. He had a great sense of privacy. I used to feel it would be almost sacrilegious to intrude on his thoughts during those times. What was he thinking on those long rides with Fairfax? Well, we can only guess. The colonel's son was going south to marry a tall young brunette, the beautiful Sally Carey. George Fairfax was well off. He could afford to marry. Washington, at 16, didn't have a penny to his name. Two months before Washington had met her, then Sally Fairfax married his closest friend, George William Fairfax. The following year, he went to the Barbados with his brother Lawrence. To the Barbados, where I hoped the climate would help this cough which has been clinging to me for several months now. While we were there, George contracted the smallpox and was desperately ill for some weeks. The disease immunized Washington to the plague which was to sweep through the colonial army many years later. The climate of the Barbados was exactly the wrong cure for Lawrence Washington's tubercular lungs. And he died at Mount Vernon shortly after their return. And to my beloved young half-brother George, in deepest affection, I do bequeath all of my lands and estates at Mount Vernon. Now, at 20, he was alone, the master of an estate. With his mother, he had little contact. The brother who had cared for him since their father died had also left this world. He was physically powerful, a tremendous horseman, an athlete, and already, as one of the older ladies put it... Impudent? <laughs> well, he danced with me six times at Colonel Fairfax's reception for Sally. He is charming, though, when he wants to be. I never saw such a moody young man... My place of residence is at present at his lordship. Washington, writing of his stay at Colonel Fairfax's plantation, where he was to spend much of the following nine years. My place of residence is at his lordship's, where I might, was my heart disengaged, spend my time very pleasantly, as there's a very agreeable young lady in the same house. But that's only adding fuel to fire. It makes me the more uneasy, for I often and unavoidably being in company with her... 
revives my former passion for your lowland beauty. Thus began the relationship which was to remain an important part of Washington's inner life until his death. Some say that Sally Fairfax was a flirt. She had her portrait painted with a pretty flower in her hand and a come-hither smile on her lips. The details are not known. We know that he was Virginia's most eligible bachelor for the next nine years and never once considered marriage. We know that he wrote to Sally often of his unfulfilled love for her and that he destroyed all of his diaries and letters during this period. We know that at the age of 66, after 25 years of separation from her, years during which he had won the revolution and been twice president of the United States, he wrote to her, None of which events, however, nor all of them together, have been able to eradicate from my mind the recollection of those happy moments, the happiest in my life which I have enjoyed in your company. I do, sir. I remember the times when Colonel Washington came courting Miss Martha. Yes, I do. Great times, sir. Great times. Old Cully, Martha Custis' family servant, speaking to the historian George Washington Park Custis. He looked like a proper man, I tell you, sir. Never see the likes of him, though I've seen many in my day. So tall, so straight when he sat on a horse and rode with such an air. Ah, sir, he was like no one else. Many of the grandest gentlemen in the gold lace were at the wedding, but none looked like the man himself. He married Martha Custis, the richest woman in Virginia, on January 6th, 1759. And didn't he underestimate this marriage to Martha Custis? Dr. James Craik the personal physician who attended him from childhood to his death, who knew him perhaps better than any other man. Nay, then he underestimated. Perhaps it didn't have the romance you read about in the storybooks, but it was strong and deep. Think on it. It lasted for 40 years. It survived childlessness, revolution, and years of separation. Aye, and it survived Sally Fairfax, too. I know the man. I know him like my own son. And he had a streak of honor in him that once he decided on a course of action, you couldn't swerve him. Oh, I'm not trying to persuade you that he ever forgot Sally. Far from it. But what he had with Martha, you can't break asunder. It was a relationship that grew day by day. And there's a deep satisfaction in that. They liked each other. And they respected each other. There was more to that round little woman than he had ever dreamed. Seven weeks after his marriage to Martha, he wrote Sally Fairfax. I dare to believe that you are happy, and I wish fervently that I will be happy too. Misconstrue not my meaning. Doubt it not, nor expose it. And to a close friend in England? I am now, I believe, fixed at this seat with an agreeable consort for life. And I hope to find more happiness in retirement than I ever experienced amid a wide and bustling world. He was 27, and he had come to terms with his own turbulent and tormented soul. I tell you, sir, he was a hard man to know. But after a while, uh, some say he was stony and frozen, but when you come to know him, you get to see that he runs deep with feelings. So deep that I do believe it frightens him sometimes. There are depths in a man's soul which no one, not even himself, may plumb. He gets into rages. Thomas Jefferson. He gets into rages and passions when he cannot command himself. His temper was naturally high-toned, but reflection and resolution had obtained a firm and habitual ascendancy over it. If, however, it broke its bonds... He was most tremendous in his wrath. Sir, your impertinent letter of the 24th was delivered to me yesterday by Mr. Smith. As I am not accustomed... George Washington to Colonel Mews. As I am not accustomed to receive such from any man, nor would have taken the same from you personally without letting you feel some marks of my resentment, I would advise you to be cautious... I was his man until he died. Billy Lee, Washington's mulatto servant. And he was hard. Just as he was on himself. 
But he was fair. And a man could count on it. Sir, with this letter comes a Negro, which I beg favor of you to sell. Washington to the captain of a slaver, written in 1766. To sell in any of the islands to which you may go for whatever he will fetch. And bring me in return for him... One hogshead of the best molasses, one hogshead of the best rum, one barrel of limes, good and cheap, one port of tamarinds, that this fellow is a rogue and a runaway I shall not pretend to deny, but that he is exceedingly healthy and strong and good at the whole. The whole neighborhood can testify, which gives me reason to hope that he may, with your good management, sell well, if kept clean and trimmed up a little, when offered for sale. We had many long talks on the subject of uh, slavery. The Marquis de Lafayette, whom Washington regarded as his dearest friend. And he came to see, I think, that the whole institution of slavery was abhorrent and could not be reconciled with democracy. It was characteristic of the man that his sense of justice would enable him always to select the fine principle and make it a part of his life. I hope it will not be conceived... Washington, 1786. ...from these observations that it is my wish to hold the unhappy people who are the subject of this letter in slavery. I can only say that there is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I do to see a plan adopted for the abolition of it. But there is only one proper and effectual mode by which it can be accomplished. And that is by legislative authority. When he died, he left it in his will that I should be free if I choose it. And he forbid any slave of his to be transported down or sold up. And he say, free all slaves which belong to him in his name. And he say, he like to free all slaves now, but some belong to Miss Washington. So when she die, they all be free. And he say if they cannot work or find food, his heirs shall feed and clothe them. And I do moreover most pointedly and most solemnly enjoin it upon my executors to see that this clause of my will be religiously fulfilled without evasion, neglect, or delay. In 1774, the wealthy young fox hunter, lean and sunburned, dressed in his uniform of commander of the Virginia militia, was sent to the First Continental Congress as delegate from his own colony. He was 42 years old at the time. He had been an aide to General Braddock in the campaign against the French in 1755. He had published a rather famous account of his military expedition against Jumonville. And there was a murmur when he entered the assembly. I thought it a little ridiculous at the time. The speaker is Benjamin Franklin. He was the only man there in full uniform. Buff and blue, as I recall it. Same color he adopted for the Continentals. Well, naturally, I turned to Jefferson and asked who the fop was. That's Washington, he told me. Fox hunter from Virginia. Well, he made a speech at the Virginia Burgess only last month in which he offered it raise a thousand men at his own expense and march at their head to Boston. <laughs> I put my handkerchief in front of my face to smile at that. It occurred to me how the devil a farmer from Virginia concerned himself with the fact that they were going to close Boston and starve us out. Well, somehow I couldn't take my eyes off the man. Nobody could. He didn't seem at all foppish or ill at ease. There was an air about him. He moved easily, by far the most graceful big man I've ever seen. And when he finally spoke haltingly, ill at ease, you, you, you got the feeling that here was a man with such a fine sense of his own inner life that he bore no shame or embarrassment, even at speaking so poorly. He accepted himself with his imperfections and he knew his limitations. He is the only man I ever met who was utterly and completely devoid of personal fear. Before the Congress had ended, we all knew it. He was our man. NBC is bringing you Biography in Sound, George Washington, the man nobody knows. 
We'll continue with part two after a brief pause for station identification. We continue now transcribed with part two of George Washington, The Man Nobody Knows. They came shuffling in from the farms of Massachusetts and Vermont, sullen, stubborn, heads hanging, big hands gripping long squirrel guns or scythes or wooden clubs. They stood around in silent groups looking at the tall man in the buff and blue uniform of the Virginia militia, appraising him silently, taking the measure of the man. When their officers tried to dress them up in some kind of order, they moved with a slow resentment, eyeing them suspiciously. Most of them wore tattered work clothes. Some were barefoot. Occasionally, you would see a father and a son, no more than 11 or 12. To look at them, you'd wonder what spark had ever prompted them to come. Could these men know the meaning of Jefferson's high-flown rhetoric, the talk of liberty and equality and freedom? Could ignorant folk such as these ever be shaped into an army that would stand against the immaculate ranks of British grenadiers? When you live hard the way we did, and the rocks have got a mortgage on the land, you get in the habit of helping out. Like somebody come down one day and says, Japheth? Old man Woodard's building a new barn where the old one burned. And you tell your wife, I think I'll go down and lend a hand, old man Woodard, with his barn, you see? Well, one day Samish, uh, he has the place near the plank road. He come by and says, uh, Japheth, they got a hard row in Boston. And Israel Putnam's going over there with some of the boys to lend a hand. So I just said to Samantha, I think I'll go down and look around the camp with old Putt. And I went. Yankee is a peculiar bird. Israel Putnam. He doesn't care about his head, but he dreads like the devil having his shin shot up. Give him something to stand behind, and he'll fight as long as he can see anything to shoot at. I told General Washington when he first come down to Cambridge to take command that we ought to fight guerrilla style, but he wanted discipline. Discipline. Why, before he come, when Artemis Ward was in command... There wasn't a day passed when an officer wouldn't get knocked down by one of his own men. Like as not, he'd just get up and whip the tar out of his man, or else we'd get a new officer. But the general, he tried to put a stop to it. Torture, he used. When he'd find a man guilty of rioting, he'd had him straddle a board six foot off the ground. Then they'd tie weights to his feet and leave him. A lot of the men wouldn't stomach it. They went home. Well, the general learned pretty quick that you can't bully a man into fighting for you. He learned. You got to say that no matter how you feel about him. Dear Jack, I am now to bid brother adieu to you... George Washington to his brother, 1776. I am now to bid adieu to you and to every kind of domestic ease... I am embarked on a wide ocean, boundless in its prospect, and in which perhaps no safe harbor will be found. My dearest... George Washington to his wife, 1776. I would not think of leaving this city without dropping you a line, especially as I do not know whether it will be in my power to write again till we get to camp. I go fully trusting in that providence which has been more bountiful to me than I deserve and in full confidence of a happy meeting with you sometime in the fall. I return an unalterable affection for you, which neither time nor distance can change. My best love to Jack and Nellie, and regard for the rest of the family. The time is now near at hand. General Orders, July 2nd, 1776. The time is now near at hand, which must probably determine... Whether Americans are to be free men or slaves, let us therefore animate and encourage each other and show to the whole world that a free man contending for liberty on his own ground is superior to any slavish mercenary on earth. Now there was no retreat. The formative years were over. The meld that had worked in him as a child and a youth and a young man was brought to a boil. Washington, the man, had taken his cross on his shoulders and started on the long pilgrimage of his mature life. 
I know the integrity of my own heart. George Washington, 1776. I know the unhappy predicament I stand in. I know that without men, without arms, without ammunition, without anything fit for the accommodation of a soldier, that little is to be done. And what is more mortifying, I know that I cannot stand justified to the world without exposing my own weakness and injuring the cause. Those first months, he was like some kind of animal in a cage. When I'd fix his breakfast in the morning, he'd look at it like a child whose mama's trying to make him eat. And he'd push it away. That saved his life one morning in Cambridge when one of his bodyguards tried to poison him. I gave the plate to the hound and he died. And I tell Master George, he don't say a word. He just walk out. And by and by, they come and get Master Hickey and they hang him up to die. He was in a fierce temper those days, was Master George. No troops, he said. No money, no nothing. How'd they expect me to fight a war? One day, he write one of those letters to the gentleman in Congress. <laughs> Seemed like he's always writing. Writing. And he look up at me, sudden-like, and he say, Will, the Spanish pears will be in bloom at Mount Vernon. And he stopped. And I seen he was a thousand miles away by the look in his eye. A thousand miles away. He wrote to us. I remember it must have been August... Because the Spanish pear was in blossom. Sally Fairfax. The letter was addressed to my husband. I wondered why he had sent it. Didn't say much. Something about needing supplies and money. It ended... Remember me affectionately to your wife. And that was all. Neither of us ever really understood why he wrote that letter. Well... I'm an old woman. It doesn't really matter now. While Washington tried to make an army out of the chaotic, poverty-stricken mob at Cambridge, the British were encamped in Boston, only a few miles away. It has always been a source of utter amazement to me... Sir William Howe, commander of the British garrison at Boston. ...that Washington didn't simply march into Boston and put us all to the sword. Half our troops had pneumonia, the other half had smallpox, and we had no supplies at all. If he'd sent 5,000 men at this, we, he would have destroyed the entire king's force in America. Instead, he let himself send his most brilliant general, Benedict Arnold, racing off to Canada to try and take Quebec. Oh, Lord. By the time he was ready to attack, we'd made plans to evacuate the city anyway. To take a town without killing a single man was an empty victory. I never saw much value in fighting for towns anyway. But it looked good on the communiques, and the king rather expected it. There were rumors to the effect. Rumors which reached mine own ears. The speaker is George III, King of England. To the effect that General Howe's sentiments were with the colonists. Some went so far as to whisper that he deliberately abandoned each opportunity to crush the insurrection. I was also aware... He was a violent Whig and had stated publicly that America deserved her independence and he would like to see her have it. But I know Sir William. He is, as you may recall, a cousin of mine with good German blood. I believe he did his best. Personally, I was never convinced of the value of those ridiculous outposts to my country anyway. This fellow Washington. I can't understand what makes a loyal British subject who has everything in life, a good income, position, friends, what makes such a man become subversive and try to overthrow his government by plotting and force of arms. So, if it wasn't Howe's treachery, what was it? I spoke to my minister, Lord North, and he makes troops. I don't know if our generals frighten the enemy, he tells me, but they certainly frighten me. This is funny. I was always convinced, as I am now, that the majority of Americans were loyal British subjects. The number of loyalists who joined our forces was enough to show this. Burgoyne's army was doubled in a single campaign by loyal Americans. And now, secondly, I will not tolerate opposition, 
The opposition in my own country is fantastic. They plot against me. It's a fact, don't doubt it. I've heard them whisper I am mad, that I impose my will on every minister. But I am the king. How can I be mad? Why didn't they surrender? They are the ones who must be mad. I, I simply don't understand how we lost the colonies unless it was because of this fellow Washington, who was certainly out of his mind to keep fighting and losing and losing and fighting. And I sent them German soldiers. German soldiers, mind you, and the finest in the world. And, and those idiots of the generals, they, they betrayed me. Yes, how to? He never wanted to win. Oh, I should have known from the start. The indications of the psychosis into which George III lapsed are found in this statement. But there are also in it some interesting observations. Let's listen now to General Charles Lee, whom Washington had sent ahead to fortify New York City. If it hadn't been for the stupidity and dilatoriness of the British, if the British generals hadn't been blind to their opportunities, George Washington's reputation today would probably be that of a misfit, a failure, and one of the worst blunderers in the history of military strategy who ever lived. Only an utter fool would have attempted the defense of New York. First of all, he shouldn't have tried to defend it. Second... He violated the most simple principle of warfare by dividing his troops, putting half the army over in Brooklyn and the other half in Manhattan. Good Lord, if it hadn't been for the rain, they'd have cut us to ribbons marching in from Long Island like that. They praised him for the retreat. That's what galls me. Retreat. There they were. The best of our army crowded along the shore in Brooklyn, waiting for a bunch of leaky old rowboats to take them across. If Howe had swept down on them, he'd have ended the bloody war right there. But he waited. He always waited when it seemed he could finish us. And by morning, Glover's regiments of Marblehead fishermen had managed to row them across to Manhattan. So there we were in Manhattan with the British just waiting for a few boats... So they could cross the East River and finish us. And still that fool Washington hung on. He was incapable of making a decision. He was the worst military man I ever met in my life. I remember the morning they crossed the East River to come and get us. It was the 15th of September. The first we knew the cannons over at the river were booming. The general, he was at headquarters in Harlem. He says, Horace, saddle my horse. I did. And then we followed him down the island. Well, we got halfway down and we saw the first of our troops. They was running like the devil was chasing them. And it was a red-coated devil. Well, first thing, the general rears up his horse and he yells in that big voice, Stand up and fight! But you couldn't stop them soldiers. They was full of panic. Then he grabs a whip out of my hands and he, he rides right into them, cutting and hacking at them like he was crazy. It was no use. They run right past him. He hacked at them till there was none left. And then he just sat there. And I could see them big shoulders moving like he was crying. I looked up, and, and there was the British coming up the island like a fury. They started shooting. But you know the British, they used to shoot from the hip, and you can't hit nothing that way. Finally, I, I give his horse a tug, and I said, Come on, General, you'll get killed. He didn't say a word. I had to lead that horse at a gallop all the way back to Harlem. You know, for a minute there, I thought he didn't care if he lived or died. We are encamped now on the heights. From my tent, I can see the lower part of Manhattan in flames. A rumor that I sent incendiaries to do it, but I did not. I remain firm in my pledge to Congress to prevent the destruction of New York City. The Congress, a bunch of well-fed, squabbling idiots... They're comfortable down there in Philadelphia. What do they care that a thousand men desert me every week, that I have no food, no cavalry, no boots, no uniforms? Arnold is in the north, and no word for days. I've got to get to New Jersey. It's our only hope. Thank God for Knox and Green and Hamilton. As for Lee, I have grave reservations, although I still believe he's a good man. Dear London. George Washington to his brother, September 30th, 1776. The enemy is within a stone's throw of us. I discharged a regiment the other day that had in it 14 men fit for duty. 
In short, my situation is such that if I were to wish the bitterest curse to an enemy this side of the grave, I should put him in my stead with my feelings. Yet I do not know what plan of conduct to pursue. I see the impossibility of serving with reputation or doing any essential service to the cause by continuing in command. And yet I am told that if I quit the command, inevitable ruin will follow. In confidence, I tell you that I was never in such an unhappy, divided state since I was born. Retreat, and retreat, and retreat. To White Plains, across New Jersey, to Trenton. This was the pattern of his life. Indecision, disaffection, disappointment, and loneliness. There is no question about it. In those early days of the war, George Washington was a poor general. He was trying to satisfy Congress on the one hand, his generals on the other, and leaving himself out almost completely. Congress ranted, disagreed, and did nothing. His generals chafed under the lack of decision. His men staggered barefoot through the snow. And then one wintry night, the fox hunter... Tired of playing the fox. Gentlemen, desperate diseases require desperate remedies. I've been sitting on my temper for many months now, and I serve notice to you and to Congress and to the world that from this moment I must do as I see fit. On Christmas night of 1776, the ragged army which had been falling back for weeks suddenly turned about and dealt a staggering blow to its pursuers. Once again, Glover's fishermen from Marblehead were pressed into service. This time, they ferried 2,400 men, plus all of the artillery left in the Continental Arsenal, across the Delaware. At dawn, they attacked the well-stocked Hessian camp like a pack of ravening wolves. As a result of this, and the victory at Princeton which followed, Congress vested new authority in Washington and he began to shape the army according to his own views. His true greatness did not show itself in the victories he won. Lafayette, Valley Forge, 1777. Rather, it showed itself in defeat. It is the ability to inspire men with a feeling of hope in defeat that makes a leader. Any brilliant strategist can win a battle... And we had a dozen of them. Green, Gates, Arnold, Wayne. These were the wily foxes of the revolution. I confess that they could outthink and outmaneuver him on a field of battle. And yet, he would have beaten any one of them simply because in his largeness, as a human being, he would have eventually embraced them and won them over. Even his enemies, I think. It was after Gates and Arnold had won up north, when Washington was preparing to winter at Valley Forge, that the infamous Conway Cabal began to arm itself against him. The plot was simple enough. To create a large faction that would unseat Washington and replace him with Gates, or possibly Lee. Letters were sent back and forth. Meetings were held. Certain members of Congress were involved. And the whole kettle percolated merrily until a drunken officer babbled of a letter he had seen written to Gates by Conway. Washington sat down and wrote the shortest letter of his life. Sir, a letter which I received last night contained the following paragraph, quote, In a letter from General Conway to General Gates, he says... Heaven has been determined to save your country or a weak general and bad counselors would have ruined it. End quote. I am, sir, your humble servant, George Washington. The effect of this letter was like lightning striking a chicken coop. Conway quickly denied he had written such a line and blamed it on Gates. Gates hastened to reassure Washington that Conway was the intriguer and not he. And pretty soon the whole plot exploded into public with denials and accusations. Washington sat calmly by and watched it unfold. 
His letter had been a shot in the dark. He had no idea there was any cabal forming against him. Finally, like a patient father who has listened to his children's confessions, he brushed aside the whole affair as casually as if it had never existed and stuck to his main purpose of restoring harmony to his command. On July 4th, 1778, unknown to Washington, his good friend, General Cadwallader, faced General Conway in a duel, sent a pistol bullet crashing into his mouth, disfiguring him for life. Blood-stained footprints in the snow. Valley Forge, winter of 1777-78. Out of the despair, out of the hunger, out of the blundering and the bickering and the intrigue, an army emerged. When they left Valley Forge that spring, they were like slavering wolves, ready to fall on anything that stood in their path. At their head rode the fox hunter, his eyes tired and his heart heavy. The enemy, the sleek fox, moved up out of Philadelphia and up through New Jersey, and they tracked him. At Monmouth, The hunter overtook the fox. He was everywhere. Lafayette. All over the battlefield. I never beheld so superb a man. At one moment, he went down in a heap with his white horse, and we thought he had been killed. But he stood up, and Billy Lee, his servant, brought up another mount, a chestnut mare. He spurred right into the thick of the fighting again. After the battle... General Lee, who had deserted his troops in the midst of the action, was court-martialed. He said he had tried to save the main body of his men in a hopeless situation. But the rumor was that he had tried to lose the battle deliberately, sold out to the British. The war dragged on to its weary conclusion now. Battles were won and lost. The British enthusiasm waned. And it was a three-year process of wearing down which came to a smashing climax at Yorktown. On Friday, October 19, 1781, the British Army surrendered after six years of war. It was a warm October day. John Hyde Preston, in his book A Short History of the American Revolution, describes the surrender at Yorktown. Washington rode out on the right, very superb on his big white battle charger, his boots polished, his hair finely powdered. Lafayette, at the head of his famous light infantry, was having a hard time making his horse behave, jabbering in French and laughing very much at everything that was said to him. Over on the left, near the banks of the York River, stout old Papa Rochambeau bobbed along proudly at the head of his dapper French legions. The country people stood gaping. But in the bay, the riggings of the tall ships were full of singing sailors. Then there was a blast of music on the autumn air, growing louder. The surrendering army appeared. The long red and blue columns marched by, laying their flags on the ground, stacking their guns. It was all over. I can truly say... Washington. ...that the first wish of my soul is to return speedily into the bosom of that country which gave me birth. And in the sweet enjoyment of domestic happiness and the company of a few friends to end my days in quiet when I shall be called from this stage. This is the last letter I shall ever write, Washington, while in the service of my country. The hour of my resignation is fixed at twelve this day. He was intent on having Christmas dinner at home. Tobias Lear, who kept Washington's private account, On the 23rd, he was in the saddle again, headed back from whence he came. He took with him the following items, which I entered in the cash book. A locket, five shillings and fivepence. Three small pocketbooks, one and ten. Three sashes, one and five. Dress cap, two and eightpence. Hat, three and ten. Handkerchief, one pound. Children's books, four and six. One whirly gate, one and six. One fiddle, two and six. Four quadrille boxes, one pound, seventeen shillings and sixpence. The gifts were for the children and Mrs. Washington. 
Such times as there was then, gentlemen. Old Cully, Mrs. Washington's family servant. Such times, I tell you. It was almost like the days when he came courting Miss Martha. Laughing and singing, and him bouncing the little ones on his knee, and dancing with the ladies, and folks coming in carriages from miles around to wish him well and shake his hand. And in the morning he was up at four o'clock, and he took his man, Billy Lee, and they rode out on the farms, and they were smiling like there was some big joke all the time. But I tell you, sir, I seed Miss Martha look at him sometimes quick like, and I could tell she was worried about him. Seems like he was always going, like a big clock that can't unwind. Up at four, in the saddle. I remember when Dr. Craig and Master Bushrod come in saying they couldn't keep up with him. He'd started his horse and drove her till she liked to drop from it. On April 30th, 1789, he took the oath of office as first president of the United States. My movements to the chair of government will be accompanied by feelings not unlike those of a culprit who is going to the place of his execution. A year before, he had refused an offer of the crown by Colonel Nicola, one of his officers. He called me into his headquarters at Newburgh, Washington Secretary Jonathan Trumbull. I remember it well because he was almost trembling to hold back his rage. I have the original notes right here in my folio. Sir, it is with a mixture of great surprise and astonishment I have read the sentiments you submitted for my perusal. Be assured, sir, no occurrence in the course of the war has given me more painful sensations. If I am not deceived in the knowledge of myself, you could not have found a person to whom your schemes are more disagreeable. Let me conjure you, if you have any regard for your country, banish these thoughts from your mind. The part I acted in the American Revolution is well known. This is Tom Paine speaking. I shall not here repeat it. It is time, though, sir, to speak the undisguised language of historical truth. The person addressed is President Washington. You slept away your time in the field till the finances of the country were exhausted, and you have but little share in the glory of the final event. You commenced your presidential career by swallowing the grossest adulation. If you are not great enough to have ambition... You are little enough to have vanity. John Adams, he said, and John, it is known, was always a speller after places and offices. John has said that the presidency should be made hereditary in the family of Washington. He did not go so far as to say the vice presidency should be made hereditary in the family of John Adams. The character which Mr. Washington has attempted to act in this world as a sort of a non-describable chameleon thing called prudence. It is in many cases a substitute for principle and is so nearly allied to hypocrisy. As to you, sir, treacherous to private friendship, for so you have been to me, and that in the day of danger, and a hypocrite in public life, the world will be puzzled to decide whether you are an apostate or an imposter. And so they turned on him one by one. Hamilton, Jefferson, Adams. Isolating him in the presidency. Enraged at his treaties. At his unwillingness to have America drawn into the French conflict. At his dogged conservatism and determination to proceed slowly and cautiously. The attack on me is like a cry against a mad dog couched in such indecent and exaggerated terms as could scarcely be applied to a Nero or a pickpocket. A few stood by him. Franklin, who was aging rapidly, and Lafayette, and Dr. Craik, and some of his old generals, like Knox. I care what they think. It pains me deeply that they desert me. But I am determined to listen to my heart. And I know my own integrity. We need 20 years of peace. We need a strong national government. We need neutrality and a commercial treaty with England. Jefferson opposes me. Well, let him. They say I betray my old comrades, the French. Let them talk. My heart answers to me. On September 17, 1796, he published his farewell address to the people after serving two terms as president. When John Adams was elected second president, 
Washington walked through the streets to his home to congratulate him. When he approached the house... John Adams. When he approached the house, an immense crowd followed him, moving in total silence. When he reached my door, I greeted him. And then he turned around and looked out on the crowd of people who had followed him. I honestly don't think he expected it. It is my belief that he felt he had been deserted by all his fellow Americans instead of a few in high office. Do they tell you he was a cold person? I tell you, no one ever saw him so moved. The tears rolled unchecked down his cheeks. He was 64 years old. And I do believe it had taken him all those years to learn to cry. On Sunday, December 8, 1799, he contracted a sore throat. He chose to ignore it and spent the day marking trees for cutting and inspecting the farm. That night, he wrote some letters, read the newspapers, and went to bed. Next morning, his friend, Dr. Crake, was called, along with two other physicians. He was bled and given molasses and vinegar. The bleeding weakened him, but he was bled again, as was the medical procedure. About five o'clock, Dr. Crake came into the room. Tobias Lear, his bookkeeper. The general said, Doctor, I die hard, but I am not afraid to go. The doctor pressed his hand, but could not utter a word. About ten o'clock, he made several attempts to speak. At length, he said, I am just going. Have me decently buried. I bowed assent, for I could not speak. He looked at me again and said, Do you understand me? I said, Yes. And he said, Tis well. About... Ten minutes before he expired, his breathing came easier. Dr. Craig came to the bedside. And the general's hand fell from his wrist. I took it in mine and pressed it to my bosom. Dr. Craig put his hands over his eyes, and then he expired without a struggle or a sigh. Mrs. Washington, who was sitting at the foot of the bed, asked in a firm voice, is he gone? I could not speak. Tis well, she said, in the same voice. All is now over, and I shall soon follow him. I have no more trials to pass through. I think I knew General Washington intimately and thoroughly. Thomas Jefferson. His mind was great and powerful without being of the very first order. It was slow in operation, but sure in conclusion. Hearing all suggestions, he selected what was best. And certainly no general ever planned his battles more judiciously. He was incapable of fear, meeting personal dangers with the calmest unconcern. His integrity was most pure. His justice, the most inflexible I have ever known. No motives of interest or consanguinity of friendship or hatred were able to bias his decision. He was indeed, in every sense of the word, a wise, a good, and a great man. In Bath, England, Sally Fairfax, widowed and childless, clinging to a letter she had received from George Washington only two months before his death. Un malheur ne vient jamais seul. On n'estime jamais une chose assez qu'avant que nous l'avons perdu. These are the words she wrote in her Bible. Sorrow never comes singly. We never value a thing rightly till it is lost. The preceding program was transcribed. Monitor takes you everywhere each weekend on NBC Radio. This is Bill Henry with the news. 
The hot and muggy weather which prostrated dozens of persons in the eastern half of the United States apparently did not interfere with the heavy thinking of the people whose business it is to interpret the sayings of others. The net impression seems to be that those two dictators, Nick Khrushchev of Russia and Juan Perón of Argentina, within the past 24 hours have protested just a little too strongly about the strength of their positions. The Russian dictator boasted about the economic strength of his country, while Perón, a somewhat shaky survivor of a popular uprising, took to the radio to say that his enemies were impotent in their attacks against the people. As usually happens, the experts now believe that there probably is something wrong with the Soviet economy and that Perón is probably more unsure of his position than at first believed. Everybody in Washington seemed disposed to spend the day trying to forget the tragic consequences of the July 4th holiday weekend, which cost more lives than any previous similar weekend in history, traffic deaths alone climbing close to the 400 mark. President Eisenhower, after sending a get-well message to Democrat Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson this morning, who's in a serious condition as a result of a heart attack, lunched with Republican congressional leaders Bill Noland and Joe Martin, and then went to a special showing of This is Cinerama. Tomorrow he meets all the congressional leaders and will hold his usual weekly news conference. Up on Capitol Hill, the House of Representatives made news by voting a reward of up to half a million dollars to anyone providing information regarding the smuggling of any atomic device into this country. It also voted that henceforth all presidential papers shall become the property of the United States government. For many years, these papers have been deemed to be the private property of the presidents, and their disposition has ranged from complete destruction, as in the case of President Harding, or long secrecy, as in Lincoln's case, to the triumphant carrying off of carloads, as in the case of Presidents Roosevelt and Truman, who undertook to set up private libraries. In addition today, the House voted to limit to three years the period during which Korean War veterans can draw GI unemployment compensation. The Senate distinguished itself by letting the Dixon-Yates question, which has been one of the loudest debates in recent history, fizzle out like a wet firecracker today when it voted one and one-third billion dollars to the Atomic Energy Commission and the Tennessee Valley Authority, leaving untouched an appropriation of six and a half million for Dixon Yates. There's good reason, of course, to believe that the Dixon Yates private power plant project will be dropped as a result of the decision of the city of Memphis to build its own power plant. So the whole affair now looks like a Mexican standoff with both sides loudly claiming victory. Nobody seems to know if anything will come of the protests against flagrant violations of the Korean armistice by the North Koreans. Probably not. But there is a good deal of interest on the other side of the world in the fact that the first West German officers will join the headquarters staff of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization before the end of this month. The French Assembly, apparently anxious not to rock the boat on the eve of the forthcoming Geneva Big Four conferences, postponed debate on the latest troubles in North Africa, and apparently Italy is to have a new government headed by left-of-center Antonio Segni, whose cabinet, however, apparently will continue to be strongly pro-Western. There are rumors today of a red crackdown and a reign of terror in Hungary, but these rumors are unverified. There's been a good deal of economic news today, all of it rather encouraging. The government has set the support price of wheat two cents per bushel higher than a year ago. The Commerce Department predicts continuing expansion of booming business, and the stock market, which continued rising, today heard after the New York Stock Exchange closed that General Motors plans a three-for-one stock split and set up a saving and stock purchase plan for salaried employees. And Navy Secretary Charles Thomas has raised some eyebrows in the Navy Department by calling for younger admirals. And that's the news to this moment. This is the NBC Radio Network.